Hola, buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this seminar, webinar on sensor use of remote sensing in Autoptera Pass on Grasshopper and Locust. I would like to welcome you. I also would like to introduce you, Dr. Stephanie Bloom. She is the Higsby coordinator, the Inter-American Coordinator Group in Plan Health. She's also the NAPO Executive Director, the North American Plant Protection Organization. I also would like to introduce Dr. Ana Marisa Cordero, who is Agricultural Health and Food Safety Program Manager for NAICA. This webinar is organized by the Inter-American Coordinate Group in Plant Health, HICSPI, and NAICA. And that's why we're inviting Dr. Stephanie Boone and then Anna to do the introduction. Thank you very much. Buenos días a todos. Uh, los saluda Good Stephanie morning, everybody. Bloom. This is Stephanie Bloom. Desde la ciudad de Raleigh, en From Carolina Raleigh, del Norte, North Carolina, uh, Estados Unidos, United States, donde está la sede with, de la the, organización uh, norteamericana de North protección American a las plantas NAPO. Napa. Me da muchísimo gusto a a poder a dar las palabras de bienvenida to give you this primero a todos nuestros expertos y ponentes. Experts, Muchas gracias por participar en este Thank evento. You very much for uh, in this hemos event. recibido mucha indicación de interés, así uh, que agradecemos uh, su uh, presencia hoy día. Today. También agradecer I a los organizadores like to thank the de este evento, of this event, el coordinador del Grupo de las Costas, Héctor Emilio Locus Medina, Hector Emilio y Medina, también al doctor Mario Putbeck, que Mario va a ser uno de los ponentes, Putbeck, pero así mismo participó activamente en la organización. Um, de nuevo, también agradecer al IICA como Secretaría Aika, Técnica again, de este grupo the, uh, y agradecer a todos group. los que se han unido and esta mañana para oír a nuestros expertos. Tendremos oportunidad de hacer we'll preguntas y de dialogar to, con ellos, uh, así que los invito a tener una so participación activa. De nuevo, bienvenidos a todos Welcome y again. muchas gracias. Ana Marisa, to you. Ana Marisa, a ti. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I hope you are doing well. Thank you very much to everybody who is here. Our uh, speakers also for to be part of this initiative and all participants for their interest in continue with this initiative. As it was mentioned, this is a joint effort of the uh, Inter-American Group in Plant Health and AICA in order to support the exchange of experiences to encourage knowledge as a way to provide official services with tools that allow them to strengthen the capacity in order to prevent and manage pests. The introduction of tools, of digital tools, as well as technological, to work in pest prevention, as well as the work and joint effort of private and public sectors, they become very important elements to strengthen this capacity, this prevention capacity, to, as well as to manage pests. I also would like to congratulate you for this initiative. I wish you the best success. I encourage you to continue participating so that everybody learns from these experiences, which allow us to implement 
good uh, best practices in our countries and to strengthen our capacity to prevent pests and emergency. Thank you very much again. A big hug to everybody. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Stephanie. Before we start, a couple of details. We want to thank the Napo's generous generosity. Thanks to them, we have in English and Spanish interpretation. Therefore, our sincere thanks. I also would like to ask everybody to turn the cameras on in order to take a picture of the event before continuing. Now, the coordinator of the group, Hector Emilio Medina. As Dr. Bloom mentioned, he's a campaign chief, and he is also in charge of the Locus program in Argentina, and is a coordinator for the working group in Argentina as well. Thank you very much, Lourdes. Good morning. Good evening, good afternoon, everybody who is listening to us. I echo NAPO's uh, acknowledgement as coordinator of HIXB, as well as AICA, which is the technical, technical secretary for HIXB. Thank you to all the experts today, which have accepted our invitation which came from this group. I will thank also, special thanks to Dr. Mario Po from Mexico, who is gonna be also a speaker. He started this initiative to organize this event, which is very important for us. The Locust and Grasshopper technical groups has the uh, objective to be the reference group at the American level in order to promote exchange and knowledge among the different countries in the region or other countries in the world in order to manage this pest in a better way. We think it's very important to know a little bit more to exchange or to implement in our regions, our countries, activities related to remote sensing to manage this pest. Why do I think this is very important? The main purpose is, as you are aware, grasshopper, grasshopper and locust, they have this expansion cycle, which could last years for countries. The surveillance, permanent surveillance activities, monitoring, it is very difficult in terms of human resources, as well as financial. We're always surveying pests that doesn't show often, but we all know, also know that management have to be done somehow. Permanent monitoring allow us. So we have this dichotomy, and I believe remote censoring is a very good ally for us. Grasshopper and locus also as well, they have something particular, their extension, which cover a large amount of areas. Could be one country in several country regions. And we could see with the Central American locus, the South American, we can see it with the desert locus in Africa. So with remote sensing supporting us is very important in order to have the support, all the teams that are working in field to work and detect the pests as early as possible. I don't want to go to extend myself too much. 
because we have great experts who are going to be talking about their experience on their topic. Therefore, we're going to start with the presentations right away. I also would like to mention that Dr. Poth, he is a presenter and he's going to be as well the moderator for this event. In order to start, we're going to we're going to start with Dr. Kuni Sumar from APHIS. He has a presentation on the use of remote sensing in forecasting grasshopper populations in the Western United States. Dr. Sunil, go ahead, please. Thank you, Hector, and um, thank you, moderator. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, let me know when you can see my first slide. Uh, do you see my slide in full mode? Hector? Very good, excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, greetings. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we are using remote sensing in forecasting grasshopper populations in the Western United States. Uh, my name is Sunil Kumar, and I'm a quantitative risk analyst slash agriculturist in a USDA AFIS Plant Production and Quarantine, or PPQ. And I'm part of the uh, Fire Sanitary Advanced Analytics team, or called PAT. Uh, I'm based here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Dr. Derek Waller and Dr. Larry Eck for uh, providing me wonderful photos um, that uh, you would see throughout my presentation and helping me with grasshopper biology, uh, both because I'm not a, uh, an entomologist, uh, I'm, I'm an ecologist by training. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Jordan uh, Nicolette for his assistance with GIS analysis and modeling in some of these analysis that uh, you would be uh, seeing. So, well, um, not everybody, but some of you may be wondering uh, why we need to study grasshopper and why, need, why we need grasshopper forecasting tools for the Western United States. Well, when you walk across the grasslands in Western uh, United States, uh, you would see many grasshoppers hopping around uh, in front of you, especially if, when you go in summertime. And you will, uh, you know, as you will see this uh, video here in um, uh, from Montana uh, in, that was taken in 2020 by my colleague uh, Gary Adams and his uh, colleagues there. So there are approximately uh, 400 grasshopper species in uh, 17 Western states in the U.S. However, most of them are um, harmless, but a small percentage are considered uh, pest species that can cause uh, significant uh, damage. And a large number, when you you have you know large number of grasshoppers. They can eat tons of grass uh, per day and cause millions of dollars in economic damages. Therefore, uh, AFIS PPQ uh, and our partners, we conduct surveys every uh, late summer or fall across 17 uh, Western US states. And uh, data from these surveys are uh, used for generating a grasshopper uh, hazard map, uh, which is used by AFIS and uh, land managers and owners to uh, assess whether treatments may be needed. And if his uh, treatments are only conducted when directly requested and uh, the funding is available. The current grasshopper hazard map uh, that you see on the upper right uh, side of this slide, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, is based on previous year's grasshopper uh, survey data and is generated in GIS uh, using a method called empirical uh, Bayesian Kriging, uh, which is an interpolation method to generate information beyond uh, data sites. The basic premise uh, behind uh, this uh, map is that previous year's uh, grasshopper adult population uh, would lay eggs in the fall uh, that would hatch uh, in spring and contribute to uh, next year's grasshopper population. So that's what uh, the kind of you know uh, hazard map that we are using in PPQ right now. However, as you uh, know, weather conditions change from year to year. Uh, some years, you know, this map is going to be okay, uh, but in other years, it may not work. So uh, this map does not consider any climatic, landscape, or other biological factors. Therefore, uh, we're exploring uh, geospatial analytics and other science-based advanced you know, methods, such as machine learning tools, uh, to improve uh, this map to enhance decision-making. And our overall goal in this project is to forecast uh, grasshopper outbreaks uh, more accurately to identify population hotspots, uh, which can then be uh, treated more rapidly, uh, thereby reducing potential for outbreaks and safeguard uh, rainland habitats. 
when I started uh, working on this project about uh, you know, a little over two years ago, uh, I learned that grasshopper outbreaks are notoriously difficult to forecast um, due to many complex variables uh, that influence grasshopper populations. And I know some of the panelists here would agree <laughs> with that. Uh, therefore, we divided this project into four major objectives. And uh, you know, our first objective was to develop a grasshopper population forecasting model for four north central counties in Wyoming, um, which are shaded uh, yellow in this slide, as you can see. Um, this was our, our pilot project. So through this project, uh, we wanted to demonstrate uh, the use of APHIS uh, grasshopper data to develop a biologically informed uh, grasshopper uh, density you know, predictive spatial model. And we wanted to test whether we can make forecast. Uh, that means uh, make future projections of grasshopper density in these four counties. And uh, we selected these four counties because of data availability. We had long-term you know, um, grasshopper data from uh, this, this state uh, of Wyoming. And also the processing time it uh, was take, going to take me for uh, remote sensing other data layers. So I'll show you some results from this uh, objective um, soon. Uh, let me go to the methods here. Uh, this is a general uh, you know, a method slide uh, that I would like to talk to you about. And this slide here summarizes our you know, general predictive spatial modeling framework that we have been using throughout uh, this project. Uh, first, we have uh, the data from field surveys, as you can see on the left side here, uh, that is represented by these, these darts, uh, which uh, you know, is, is from the field that has species occurrences, uh, in this case for grasshoppers or species abundance data, that has GPS coordinates uh, attached to it. Next, we uh, bring this uh, data into an Excel spreadsheet that can be brought into a GIS uh, software such as ArcGIS or uh, QGIS. And then we generate a number of uh, GIS data layers, uh, which are uh, you know, um, representing different environmental variables uh, that can potentially affect the species distribution uh, or abundance, uh, such as climatic factors or you know, topographic factors or remote sensing factors. We then combine these two, uh, the field data and, uh, and the environmental data layers which are based on different hypotheses, um, you know, based on the biology of the species. Um, and then, you, you know, we use this uh, statistical or a machine learning model uh, to combine, combine these two. And the result of this exercise is this uh, map on the right side here, uh, which shows us the predictive, um, you know, pattern of, of, of abundance of the species or uh, predicted habitat suitability. Um, so, uh, we got grasshopper distribution and abundance data uh, from multiple uh, sources uh, that my colleague Jordan Nicolette will be talking to you later in this workshop. And, uh, and then we selected a number of environmental variables based on the grasshopper biology, uh, such as the timing of egg laying, overwintering, and egg hatching. So this was an, an important consideration. And my colleagues who are grasshopper experts, and they have been you know, um, working on grasshoppers for over 20 years, um, and several different, you know, uh, previous studies have, you know, guided our research on, on grasshoppers. So our environmental variables included uh, climatic variables and soil variables. Uh, we did not consider only average climatic conditions. I should em emphasize not just average temperature and precipitation in our models. We generated uh, climatic variables based on grasshopper biology. For example, I generated, um, you know, uh, winter temperature and winter precipitation and fall temperature and fall precipitation or spring temperature spring precipitation variables that were matching the grasshopper biology um, and and their phenology in our study area here in western united states and we also consider soil characteristics such as proportion of sand and clay and soil ph because soil has direct influences on grasshopper oviposition embryonic development hatching success and influences uh, uh, you know, it has direct influence on the vegetation composition as well, um, which are the host plants for uh, the grasshoppers. So uh, we consider elevation data from uh, shuttle uh, radar topography mission or SRTM, which is again, you know, uh, based on remote sensing. Uh, it uh, was used to generate topographic variables such as slope aspect uh, and topography exposure and some other variables. Uh, we also included land use land cover, canopy cover, and enhanced vegetation index or EVI uh, from MODIS satellite uh, that was um, used for the months uh, that match uh, grasshopper biology for this uh, uh, pilot project. The selection of uh, EVI or Enhanced Vegetation Index uh, in this case uh, was based on uh, a review of my uh, you know, previous studies on grasshopper and locust. As you can see, several uh, review articles that I have cited here, including one from Dr. You know, several from uh, Dr. Alexander Lechninsky and, and his colleagues and uh, several other, other uh, researchers. So these studies have shown 
uh, that the NDVI or EVI uh, from optical uh, remotely uh, optical sensors, you know, from remotely remotely sense uh, uh, satellites, uh, were useful in predicting grasshopper and locust populations. And some studies have also used uh, topographic uh, temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture data that was uh, generated, um, you know, that was based on thermal infrared, passive, and active radar sensors. So uh, now I will show you some results from a grasshopper forecasting project uh, from Wyoming uh, that is relevant to this workshop. There are you know, a lot more other uh, you know, um, results that I'm um, not sharing with you. Uh, you can read our paper for that. Um, we found that grasshopper density in four counties in Wyoming uh, was negatively correlated with March EVI, uh, whereas it was positively correlated with June EVI. We think that March EVI was probably associated with higher you know, spring precipitation that negatively affected grasshopper population by affecting uh, edge hacking, egg, egg hatching in the spring uh, time. On the other hand, uh, I think the June uh, vegetation growth uh, provided more food and uh, contributed to higher uh, grasshopper uh, density in um, in summertime here. I would like, you know, if you would like more information about uh, this pilot project, um, you can read our research article uh, that was uh, published in Journal of Economic Entomology last year. It was also covered by uh, Anthropological Society uh, ESA Today uh, blog uh, later on. Our uh, second objective in this uh, project uh, was to develop a grasshopper outbreaks uh, predictive spatial model for the entire uh, Western United States. And for this, I had obtained uh, historic uh, grasshopper survey data from 2002 to 2019 uh, from my uh, PPQ colleagues uh, that have collected this uh, GIS database. And Every year, there are 20,000 plus survey data points that are collected. So I had this data for 18 years, uh, which is really wonderful for uh, a, a, a modeler like me. And I mapped this survey data for uh, you know to five by five kilometer grid uh, to match the climate data layers that I was using. And then um, I used 2020 and 2021 uh, survey data to validate uh, this model. And um, next, I combined historic uh, grasshopper, this grasshopper survey data with uh, uh, long-term um, climate data layers and other uh, environmental variables using machine learning and develop a grasshopper outbreak uh, predictive spatial model. And uh, we have a map that shows the uh, outbreak probability, but uh, because of, uh, you know, um, it's still preliminary, I'm not sharing this in this um, presentation here. So I collected a time series of uh, climate variables, uh, 30 years climate normals from prism climate data and other environmental data layers that can potentially influence grasshopper outbreaks in our study area. Among other variables, uh, I used uh, 14 global habitat heterogeneity variables from uh, the Earth Environment website that was, um, you know, um, put together by uh, Walter Jets and his colleagues. Uh, these variables were calculated by using uh, five years of MODIS uh, AVI data, and uh, they are available at a global extent. Um, so I used that for Western United States, and um, the, I used these variables because I did not have time to download and process uh, more CVI layers for the entire Western US, which we will be doing later on uh, for you know um, further uh, improving this work. So I'm going to share uh, very limited information uh, from this grasshopper outbreak modeling due to time here. But uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. You know after this presentation. Um, so we found that out of 13 important environmental variables in this grasshopper outbreak model, seven were based on uh, remote sensing which included uh, variables such as canopy cover, as you can see the second important uh, predictor here, uh, land use land cover types, uh, topographic variables, and uh, MODIS uh, EVI-based habitat heterogeneity variables, as you see these um, you know, variables highlighted in uh, yellow color here. Uh, we found that uh, probability of grasshopper outbreaks uh, was higher in highly heterogeneous habitats, uh, which could be because heterogeneous habitats uh, probably supported higher diversity of host plants, uh, and uh, that supported more grasshopper species, uh, which resulted in uh, higher growth. We also found that grasshopper outbreaks were more likely to occur uh, in areas with 30% or uh, lower canopy cover, which could be because of the light availability uh, in our study area and also the, um, the rain lens uh, that was the focus uh, in this study. So our uh, third objective uh, in this uh, project uh, was to develop potential distribution models for uh, 12 most economically damaging and widespread range and grasshopper species in the Western United States. 
And for this, we are using a maximum entropy-based machine learning model called uh, Maxent. And thanks to Jordan Nicolette for helping with this, this objective. Uh, you will hear a little bit more about it uh, from him later on in this workshop. And um, you know, uh, for an example, you can see um, you know, we collected uh, data from entire North America because we wanted to include environmental conditions um, where these species have established, not just you know, uh, using the data from Western US. And uh, the potential distribution map that you see here is going to be for entire Western North America that we are working you know, on for these uh, 12 species. And Jordan can talk to you more about you know, what those 12 species are. Uh, but you will see uh, you know, these results coming up that will become available to public and other stakeholders and we are, you know, putting together a web app. Um, Jordan has been working on, hard on that. And uh, there will be kind of living atlas for grasshoppers. So you will be able to see uh, data for these 12 grasshopper species um, for the entire, you know, North America, including the potential uh, distribution maps. So uh, we found that uh, MODIS EVI based uh, habitat heterogeneity variables uh, were also important predictors of individual uh, grasshopper species. Um, uh, these response curve here uh, show that areas with higher habitat heterogeneity were more suitable for one of the grasshopper species called uh, Melanoplus uh, bivitatus um, in, in North America. Our fourth objective uh, in this project uh, is to develop grasshopper population uh, forecasting models for different ecoclimatic zones in the Western US. The previous grasshopper outbreak model that I showed you um, is a, based on the historic data, and that is static in nature. So that tells us what is the likelihood of grasshopper outbreak uh, in the Western United States based on the historic pattern. It doesn't tell us, you know, the likelihood of outbreak next year, what's going to happen from in 2022 or 2023. So that model I showed you earlier is not dynamic. Whereas in this uh, objective four, we want to make this model uh, dynamic so that we have different projections, different, you know, forecasts for different years. So, uh, since we know that there are regional climatic and topographic differences in these 17 states, as you see on the right side on this map here. So a forecasting model developed for uh, northern plains um, in, in the north here may not work for the central plains or southern plains and vice versa. Therefore, I'm using NEON domains. NEON stands for National Ecological Observatory Network, um, you know, which are shown here in, in red polygons, as you can see, um, to develop these eight regional grasshopper forecasting models. And uh, we are currently in the process of developing uh, data pipelines to obtain uh, MODIS EVI data and automate uh, this modeling uh, process, you know, we'll be putting uh, online. Uh, we also plan to make these models uh, available uh, in a, as a GIS web applications later on. But right now, um, our challenge is to uh, be able to harvest uh, MODIS uh, EVI data and for this large scale. So we are going to focus on one of the uh, domains and then move on to other domains uh, later on. So, uh, as I said, our goal is to develop a dynamic regional grasshopper uh, population forecasting model. We want to be able to give a map, uh, you know, dynamic map uh, for each year to our um, managers, our stakeholders here in Western United States. And uh, for that, um, we are going to replace the dynamic variables. As you see, uh, the variables, you know, are highlighted uh, here, uh, including uh, ones in red. Um, so, uh, the variables such as, you know, climate variables that are um, relatively easy to, um, you know, obtain for next year. Uh, you know, we can uh, find out, you know, we can obtain these layers uh, from data sites such as uh, Climate NA or Climate North America. Uh, this website has been developed by uh, Professor Tong Lee Wong uh, in University of, you know, British Columbia uh, in, in Canada. And, uh, you know, I was able to obtain um, the climate variables for 2022 or even for 2023, you can, we can do that. However, my challenges, you know, um, that I'm facing right now is um, I haven't found a way to obtain future uh, MODIS EVI layers yet uh, that could be used in this dynamic model. I want to be able to uh, see what is going to be EVI, potential EVI in, um, say, August of 2022. So uh, that's, you know, where we are still working on. So, um, in summary, uh, remotely uh, sensed environmental variables are important, uh, you know, predictors of um, uh, grasshopper and uh, locust uh, uh, population density. Um, for that, um, and you know, uh, how are the future EVI data layer are needed for generating the, the dynamic uh, models, you know, from year to year? And um, you know, but 
in general, you know, our, our grasshopper project that you, uh, you know, uh, heard from me today, uh, it presents an important uh, geospatial analytics and machine learning uh, modeling framework that can be adapted to forecast grasshopper and locust outbreaks in other areas. I have uh, many people to thank. Um, as you can see this busy slide here, a lot of uh, dedicated and hardworking people have contributed to this work. I have been, you know, standing on the shoulders of giant here. So I thank all of them and uh, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share this work with you. I'll be uh, happy to take any, any uh, questions now or, or if you have any comments. Back to you. Um, Very well, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar Sunil. If there were any question from the floor, we'll take it with pleasure. For the time being, I would like to make a question. Regarding the variables of modes in EVI, this is important. It's almost half of the variables are harvested here and others on earth, so in field. So my question is, do you think this importance could apply for other species of Orthoptera? Could it be similar or could every variables could become even more important, even if we're not talking about the Central American locust, but other species that are equally relevant. Thank you so much. That is an excellent question. Um, I have been working uh, in this field for over, you know, 15 years now, and I have tested uh, this kind of methods and uh, the kind of environmental variables that I talked to you about for many species, for um, native and invasive plants, uh, insects, pathogens, and, you know, even freshwater diatom for all kinds of variables. Um, the, you know, challenge is for you to put together a nice team of, you know, uh, experts on that species that you're looking at. And that is always helpful because in this case, I didn't know much about grasshoppers when I started working on, on grasshoppers. So my colleagues were informing me what can potentially impact grasshoppers. So uh, I started, um, generating those kind of variables, finding the data, say on EBI and, you know, NDBI. So yes, to answer your question, these methods can be adapted for any species. And I have presented this work to our, uh, you know, higher office here in US Department of Agriculture, and they were, are adapting the same modeling framework for uh, pollinators and honeybees in the United States. Uh, you know, um, they are also inter interested in developing the web app or looking at, you know, effect of climate change, you know, these same tools can be used to do that, you know. And um, I have uh, used these uh, same tools, you know, same methodology for uh, tree fruit insect pests, you know, for example, cardling moth, uh, apple maggot and uh, cherry fruit flies uh, in, in the, you know, United States and globally as well. So, so yes, please, uh, you know, uh, these EVI uh, variables can, you know, are, are important, you know, for quantifying the vegetation phenology uh, on the ground that can help us inform uh, the plant composition that is really difficult to quantify uh, with traditionally used tools. So remote sensing uh, plays a, a very significant role. Uh, the importance of these remotely sensed factors, you know, can vary from, from species to from species to species. They can be, you know, top five important factors, or it could be, you know, among top ten. So, uh, but I have seen, you know, most often. It is the species, you know, uh, biological factors that are more relevant. For example, in our grasshopper models, we found that degree day waste variable, or, or uh, you know, you know, the the the, um, the temperature variables or precipitation seem to be the most important one. But uh, you know, the other factors that represent uh, the host plants, or you know, by you know that were included in this case using EBI, are also you know quite important. So I hope I was able to answer your question. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Sunil Kumar. You're welcome. To continue with the program, 
we'll give the floor to Dr. John Humphreys, who will speak to us about demographic data and remote sensing to predict the population dynamics of a particular species. Dr. John Humphreys is with the USDA. And you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Are my slides being shown? Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video during the presentation, turn it back on following for questions. So as introduced, my name is John Humphreys. I am with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. And this morning, I'm going to briefly tell you about ongoing efforts to model population dynamics for several grasshopper species, including Melanopsis sanguinopes, the migratory grasshopper. Our major goal in modeling grasshoppers is to combine remote sensing and demographic information to better anticipate when and where future outbreaks may occur in the Western United States. The type of modeling that we're doing at the ARS is broadly referred to as process-based modeling, where the term process-based refers to a set of methods aimed at integrating traditional population modeling techniques with species distribution modeling approaches typically used for species range delimitation and habitat suitability assessment. After providing a few facts about sanguinopes specifically, I'll offer a conceptual framework or overview of what it is that we're trying to accomplish before moving on to describe a few examples from a recently published case study Along the way, we'll take a look at the types of data that went into the model and some of the remote sensing analyses that were conducted. Migratory grasshopper is found throughout North America and is the possibly the foremost insect pest of grain crop and rangeland forage in the U.S. Under normal conditions, density can range between zero and seven grasshoppers per square meter, but during outbreaks, population numbers can surge very dramatically resulting in more than 50 individuals per square meter. As the word migratory in the common name suggests, nymphs are capable of dispersing 8 to 16 kilometers at a time, and adults can migrate over 50 kilometers a day and repeat that for several concurrent days. The migratory grasshopper exhibits swarming behavior and boom and bust cycle dynamics that are comparable to what we see in many locust species, but not quite as intense. Given the capacity for boom and bust cycles, Forecasting grasshoppers requires that population demographics be included in models as additions to climate and other environmental influences. As traditionally applied, demographic modeling utilizes life stage information to capture mechanistic aspects of population shifts in abundance. For example, the current slide generalizes a grasshopper life cycle by showing a nymph stage, adult stage, and an egg stage as well as the ecological processes that tie or join these different stages. Processes like nymph survival, reproductive success, and egg hatching. In traditional population modeling, stage-specific abundances and the rates estimated for things like survival, nymph recruitment, and other processes are enumerated and then used as inputs for logistic growth equations or population matrices. Our goal is to perform a comparable population analysis, but to do so through time and across geographic space. Traditional population modeling is most often based on a single survey site in the landscape that has been subject to repeated surveys over a number of years. Here, the solid point represents a single survey site situated in a larger area shaded in green. With repeated sampling, stage-specific counts can be collected and compared to approximate demographic rates for reproduction, recruitment, and survival. This demographic information is then used to forecast population trends through time as illustrated here with a line graph. But these traditional models rarely consider spatial and temporal relationships among different survey sites. Rather than treating individual survey sites as independent, our goal is to concurrently multiple is to currently model multiple sites and to consider them as dependent or mutually informative. By modeling numerous sites simultaneously, estimates at known survey sites can be improved and information can be leveraged to make estimates and predictions for locations in the landscape that have not been surveyed at all. The open points with dashed boundaries in the figure at left represent unsurveyed locations. Our goal is to be able to generate a time series or population trend line for all locations in the landscape, regardless if they had been physically surveyed or not. 
Very generally, this process can be thought of as performing an interpolation or extrapolation between different survey sites. And doing this using stage specific counts, the distances between different survey sites and environmental variables related to climate, soil and vegetation to create continuous surfaces like the figure shown at the far right. These continuous surfaces will represent all the various life stage abundances, survival rates, recruitment rates, and all other facets of the population. Then, once the continuous surfaces have been created for different aspects of the population, we'll be able to quantify temporal relationships to identify any trends or boom and bust dynamics. Ultimately, the goal is to be able to predict demographic shifts for any and all locations in the landscape regardless if they had been surveyed or not. Now, because different ecological assumptions and statistical biases are required with each life stage, modeling them separately isn't ideal. In some cases, it's not appropriate. Rather, all of this information needs to go into a single model to fully account for uncertainty and potential error. So it's very important to have a single model. These slides up to this point offered a conceptual overview of our goals. Now I'm going to transition to a recently published case study to better detail actual model inputs and remote sensing analyses, as well as to provide a few examples of model results and outputs. Due to the limited time we have today, I encourage everyone to see the paper here cited for more information if they have any questions. As a case study and first attempt at process-based modeling, the grasshopper life cycle previously shown was simplified to include only the nymph and adult life stages. The focus of the case study was quantifying recruitment, which we defined as a relationship or ratio of adults in one year to the number of nymphs realized in the following year. As described during the conceptual overview, the model was constructed to allow for life-specific variation. That is, adults and nymphs were able to show different spatial and temporal trends and to respond differently to environmental influences like climate, soils, and vegetation. Of particular interest for this workshop was the use of remote sensing to identify vegetation characteristics. As part of the remote sensing component of the study, texture analyses and decomposition were performed of satellite imagery in order to summarize vegetation variability in the landscape. We'll come back to remote sensing momentarily. First, I want to mention another key aspect of the case study, which was incorporation of density dependence. So not only were adults and nymphs able to show stage specific variation, but they were also able to demonstrate density dependence such that the abundances in one year could impact or alter population numbers in the following year. So the case study was conducted in the US state of Wyoming, which is shown in the lower left portion of this slide, positioned relative to other states, including Montana to the north, North Dakota to the east, Nebraska to the east, Colorado to the south, Utah and Idaho to the west. The Keller figure at top serves to illustrate some of the major elevational features in Wyoming, including grasslands at the lower elevations in the east, here shown in blue colors, and several mountain ranges in orange and red colors, located in the north, central, and western portions of the state. You'll see some of these elevational features again in a couple other figures. Ten years of survey data were used for the case study, including data from both nymph and adult surveys. The figure here shows a separate panel for each year of data that was used, and the red open circles represent locations where nymph surveys were conducted, whereas the black circles represent locations of adult grasshopper surveys. Both the nymph and adult circles are sized according to the legend at the bottom right, to approximate the relative number of individuals sampled at each location. Importantly, it's, it's interesting to note that not only do the number of grasshoppers themselves change through time, but the sampling locations also change through time, such that the same survey sites aren't revisited every year. It's important that our model need to be considered this variation. More than 300 different environmental variables were used to characterize climate, soil, and vegetation conditions across the study area. But due to our limited time today, I'm only going to describe use of the remote sensing to capture vegetation characteristics shown across the bottom of the slide. Our starting point for remote sensing analysis was acquisition of the enhanced vegetation index, which we heard about from Dr. Kamir a few moments ago. Like the NDVI or the normalized difference vegetation index, the EVI is a vegetation layer derived from atmospherically corrected reflectance data. 
The EVI can be thought of as an updated version of the NDVI that does a slightly better job at distinguishing densely packed areas of vegetation. Although, although it's not especially important for grasshoppers, the EVI is probably most recognized as one of the better products for canopy and vegetation systems. Using the EVI data, we calculated a series of different texture metrics. Texture metrics are a type of pixel-based neighborhood statistics that quantify variation and change across the EVI image. Using a biological species as an analogy to understand this process, texture metrics treat each distinct reflectance value or color in the satellite image as though it were a unique biological species. Then different biodiversity measures are applied to the image to estimate total diversity and species turnover across the image. Continuing with the species analogy, the texture metrics can be thought of as a community composition measure, but with pixel values instead of different types of organisms being assessed. And just as there are a multitude of different ways to measure species diversity, there are also a number of different ways to measure pixel diversity and heterogeneity in an image. By applying these different measures to the EVI, a single image can be transformed into a wide variety of different variables, each representing a distinct aspect of pixel variation. A few of these different texture metrics are shown across the bottom of the slide. Shannon diversity, um, there's a dissimilarity index shown, homogeneity, et cetera. For the Sanguinipi's case study, a total of 13 metrics were calculated from the EVI. Although these 13 metrics captured different aspects of vegetation reflectance, several of them were highly correlated. So to deal with this correlation between the different metrics, a decomposition analysis was then performed. The upper left-hand corner of the slide lists the 13 different metrics that were calculated from the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI. Um, one common practice to decompose data, that is to summarize variance across a set of different factors, is to apply a principal components analysis, or a PCA. We did run a PCA as an initial step to summarize the texture metrics, but because PCAs only summarize total variation among the metrics and not variation with respect to grasshopper specifically, we also conducted a discriminant analysis. A discriminant analysis takes those principal components that result from the PCA and then assigns weights to them based on how well they help cluster different groups of interest. For this analysis, the two groups were specified in advance, one group representing observed grasshopper locations and a second group based on random draws of background locations in our study area. So rather than creating a variable that quantified total variation across the EVI, variation that most closely associated with grasshopper recurrence. The synthetic variable shown at the bottom of the slide was um, the result of that process and what was plugged into the model to represent vegetation. Very quickly, I'm going to show some of the outputs and results from the model. The slide that we're looking at currently shows a comparison of what was actually observed in terms of total grasshopper numbers by year and specific life stage to what the model estimated. The horizontal axes across the bottom list the year, whereas the vertical axes at the left-hand side of each graph represent the total number of individuals counted. The shaded bars in the background, the height of these shaded bars in the background represent the total numbers that were observed during actual field surveys. And the floating point, generally in the location of the tops of the histogram, show what the model produced as an estimate. So very generally, even at a glance, you can see that the points tend to follow the top of the histogram, suggesting that the model was able to capture between year variation that was actually observed in the landscape, and to do this for both the nymph and adult life stages separately. Though the points do follow the tops of the histograms or the bar charts, it's also important to note that at times when there are particularly low counts of grasshoppers observed or, low, or times when there are, are high counts observed, the model doesn't perform quite as well. So in the case of years 2013 and 14, for example, we see that the model estimated points are floating well above the tops of the histogram in the background, suggesting over prediction at these low times. And by 
comparison, during years like 2018 and 2019, the model estimated points are actually below the top of the bar charts, suggesting under prediction, or that the model couldn't quite capture the number of grasshoppers that were observed in a field. So in short, this shows that the model does capture interannual trends, but still struggles to capture the extreme lows and extreme highs. The figure that we're looking at currently shows a similar type of information, but these data points represent 20% of the survey data, um, survey observations that were held out for validation purposes. As with the previous slide, the red circles represent NIMP survey locations in the field and the dark circles represent adult survey locations. The horizontal axis across the bottom represents the number of grasshoppers that were actually observed at each of these locations on a log scale. And the vertical axis along the left-hand side represents the model predicted abundance. The diagonal line in gray across that bisects the graph represents perfect prediction. So if our model was performing perfectly, all these dots that we see floating in the graph would be lined up on top of that, that diagonal gray line. But what we see instead is that towards the left-hand side of the horizontal axis, at times when low numbers of grasshoppers were observed in a field, most of our points are above that diagonal, suggesting that the model ever predicts. And in contrast to that pattern, when grasshopper numbers get high, represented by the right-hand side of the horizontal axis, those points fall below the diagonal, suggesting under prediction. So those graphs suggest that we are capturing overall numbers, but most importantly, we're able to use the model predicting geographic space. So the figures that we're looking at currently show some of those results. The panel on the far left represents the abundance of NIMPs or the density of NIMPs estimated by the model. The second panel represents adults. Both the first and second panel correspond to the abundance legend across the bottom, signifying the number of individuals per square meter for each location. Now these panels symbolize the average across the entire study period. So during any particular year, these numbers may be quite a bit higher or lower. This is just for demonstration purposes. And then with that NIMF and adult information, the model also produces an estimate for recruitment rates, which is shown in the panel at the far right. Panel on the far right is more or less centered on zero, where values above zero, colored in yellow or the lighter tones, suggest that the number of NIMS is greater than the number of adults from the prior year. And where that values, where those value, where those values fall below zero, or in the blue tones, this suggests that the number of NIMS in one year were less than expected given the number of adults that were observed in the prior year. We can also use this information to predict to the future. The paper that I cited previously does this as an exercise to demonstrate the model's capacity. Um, we won't go into detail here, but essentially the SSP abbreviations that we see across the top of the screen represent different carbon emission scenarios with the least severe climate change expected for the scenario on the far left and the most severe climate change expected for the scenario on the far right. And we can estimate recruitment under each of these scenarios represented in the blue and green slides across the top. Because it's difficult to visually distinguish the changes in these figures, we also compared each of these panels to the figure at bottom, which shows the net change in recruitment through all these different scenarios. Very generally, we can see that the areas in dark blue represent those high topographical features that we saw in the elevation map, and areas in red represent areas that are projected to have increased recruitment under these different climate scenarios. So to summarize and conclude everything up, the revealed ecology that we inferred from our study indicated that many areas will stay the same or show decreased recruitment for this grasshopper species with climate change in future conditions. However, some locations will see increased recruitment, suggesting a higher potential for outbreaks. In terms of the remote sensing analysis, some of the most difficult things in terms of conducting the analysis were simply acquiring the data from different sources online and pre-processing the data before entering into the model. Because of the size of the data, this can be very time intensive and demanding exercise and requires a lot of high performance computing resources to accelerate that process. And as, as with the other data, it's challenging to harmonize data, that is to match up all the different dates and times and resolutions that are of interest for model input. The next steps, next steps that we hope to take is to incorporate more demographic processes to go beyond just nymphs and adults to incorporate reproduction and survival rates, to expand our temporal windows to better capture inter-year or intra-year seasonal and in-so cycles, 
and to explore a larger geographic area to eventually um, encapsulate the entirety of the Western United States. So with that, that is all I have today, and I am happy to take any questions. We are with Dr. Mario Put monitoring in case you have any consultation on YouTube or on Facebook or even here in our Zoom room. Thank you to the 200 people who are attending this event. I think there are no questions. A very short comment, I will ask John I think he did mention it indirectly, but if you could tell us how important is information gathered from the field, from the sites that you have conducted, and whether the structure of the information gathered from the field is important as well. There's a whole body of work performed by you and experts, but all that work could be impossible if we don't have good information collected from the field. Whether there are adults and nymphs and where they are located and the abundance variable, etc. That's what I'm interested in. How important is that? How important is to have dependable, accurate information? Having accurate and dependable and precise field observations is incredibly important. It is absolutely essential as a matter of fact. Although we could do some very broad type species range delimitation using um, just characteristics drawn from literature, for example, having those repeated surveys in the field is absolutely essential to modern any type of to modeling any type of demographic processes. Um, it's also important to mention with this issue is that it, it's very rare for that data to be collected in a consistent manner across the landscape. Often it's done by different organizations and different agencies, and sometimes those surveys aren't repeated in the exact same location or for this exact same purpose. It's also the case that many of these surveys are conducted in response to reported outbreaks where there's already observed high numbers of grasshoppers, for example, or locations that have been subject to grasshopper outbreaks in the past. This means that the physical environmental conditions and climate conditions at those locations are already highly suitable for grasshopper um, outbreaks to a large extent. Because of that, this can often bias the data because we don't have a good representation of what bad grasshopper habitat might look like for comparison. Given all this information, it's important to not only model the environmental variables of influence when you're doing any type of analysis, but also to include covariates or factors that account for error in the data biases between different collection locations, uh, biases between different temporal windows where the collection occurred, and the assumption that there may have been preferential sampling or that the samples that we do have were collected at very, very high quality, very highly suitable habitat locations. Perfect. Thank you so much, John, for your answer and for your participation. We hope to remain in contact with Jigsby. Thank you so much. Welcome. Now, to continue with this event, now we have Dr. Mario Paul Besh. He is part of the Higgs Peak uh, Locus Group. He works in Mexico with a lot of experience coordinating what happened in Yucatan. Mario's presentation on forecast is combining remote sensing and demographic data to forecast, sorry, Central American grasshopper forecast when and where. Please, uh, for the speakers, speak uh, slowly so that the interpreters can work very well. Thank you, Mario. I hope you can see it. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to try to be a very specific presentation. We're going to talk about the 
Central American Locus forecast when and where, which is the question that we all have sometimes we have a potential presence or outbreak of the pest. We're going to talk about six parts. Where is the, the locus? We're going to talk about OIRSA, the common problem in the regions, the population dynamics. We're going to do a spatial analysis to respond where and where could find some outbreaks, as well as a probabilistic analysis, and which is when. Just a forecast about the Central American locus. It is a thousand year old and present in the region. On the left, we can see the Central American region on the globe, which has been affected for this locus past. Our Mayan population suffer the impact of this pest. And it says there is the cause of the decline of this cult great culture. On the right, we see the swarming of the Central America locus has spread. We're talking about uh, middle of the last century in the south or central part. They even move up or down because there was not an organization to face this uh, problem. In 1953 is when OIRSA was created precisely due to the invasion of local swarming coming from different areas. On the right, we see uh, the OIRSA headquarter we can see this image, is, uh, which is why OIRSA was originated to man for original management of this best. What is the common problem that we've been seeing in surveillance in terms of the locus? One of the common problems is that this best is found in wide areas. This is a very important problem. On the left, you can see a publication that I like from some collaborators, where it says that there is a large area of invasion, a uh, recession zone, and then an outbreak zone, which is reducing in this inverse pyramid. The issue here of the extent area in the red circle where to explore, where to survey. We have the remote sensing with the local knowledge, uh, as well as specific biotopes. And on the right, we see a publication from last year from Clay and other colleagues. And it was mentioned before where it indicates where remote sensing played an important role and they propose how to manage this remote sensing depending on the uh, stage of the locus. For instance, when the nymph is small or when the adult, when it is mating, and they give several suggestions to manage. They also provide the sensor resolutions. Those are the sources and you can check it later on. However, an important component is always to know the populational dynamic. We talk about Central American locus, how it increases during the year. We divide it in three parts. The first, first fifth, five months, next four months is the first generation. The first one is the recession. And then in October, is the second generation. It, this can be delayed or move forward depending on the precipitation, temperature. So we can see how this increase or reduce depending on this variable. It's important to know the uh, population dynamics. In Mexico and Central America, we can see this map that we are trying to see which variables help with the outbreaks. 
we can see the importance of the agricultural areas in the green points. We see the places with locals in blue, uh, dark blue, where the uh, burnings, agricultural burns, we use a kernel point, which is part of the GIS. I can, we can see in the pictures one, two, three, briefly explaining. In the green box, you can see the green circle. Those are the logs because you can see the burning at the bottom. On the second box, the locust, uh, they are moving up, the locusts are moving up to avoid the burn. And then number three, the precipitation and the locusts that were on the upper part, they moved to the down part to move in groups because it is a land with the vegetation moist, ideal to develop for the locusts to, to develop. In addition, we're also working with the agricultural burns with indicator like MBR, we can see a satellite image. We are working the validation. This is from Guatemala. We can see the burn sites, which are a lot. And it is very likely where the outbreak can start. Precipitation is very important. You can see in this image from March 1st to May 27th, where the, we have intense precipitation. So it is important in, because in this place could be ideal for mating of the locust. Later on, the moist soil and oviposition. So we can see the sequences of satellite images with indicators. We are using the SMAP which is soil moisture active passage, easy to access. On the left, we can see an intensity year of locus from February 1st to May 30 from in 2020. In the red area, uh, there was highest moist on the soil. In comparison to 2021, there was less red intensity. There was less moisture in the, during the same period. And the locus outbreak was less than the previous year. That's why it gives you an indication of where we could analyze the outbreaks through uh, taking into account of the position. Another thing we're studying is the moist index in the vegetation. Sometimes there's not enough precipitation for the soil to be moist, but the vegetation If in addition that there is vegeta uh, moist vegetation, but due to the spraying, so the locus is reproduced in areas and agricultural production areas. To respond where we're working in potential distribution map, you can see here where the pest could be present, we, we're taking into account three variables with the team we're working on, we're analyzing more variables. And we're trying to respond here where the pest could be present. The other question, when? This is very complex uh, question. There are many factors environmental, administrative factors. The question have influence, has been affected by the, the pandemic, the reduction in budget. There was influence if we don't have uh, capable staff. So there are several factors, not, not only environmental, but are there administrative factors, which is even more complex. And it is important to be able to include it in the model to be able to respond when. So we are working in the Central America region with uh, 
dichotomic values from zero to one, as John mentioned a few minutes ago, we need to have reliable information on surveys, field surveys. We are also working with uh, multiple logistic regression models. We can see the probability of presence from zero to one when the X variable, we can see the draw during the draw period and 34 degrees, there is a probability of the outbreak to one, which is very high even when it is a draw. So I'm trying to interpret through this information to be able to answer. This is a specific example in Yucatan, the locus density from 2010 to 21, we can see in black the stronger outbreaks per square meter, and we can see every four years, we see a density of every two to 16 years in terms of density. And there were some peaks as well. And it's important because if, as long as we have the field information, it is very important. But in order to obtain this, we, have, we need to have a permanent program. So we know that sometimes when a period, a government period, there were change in policies and that affects, as Confucius says, she says to study the past in order to forecast the future, which is very important. We are also working in temporal series. Based on the information we have, we can forecast the surface we can control the following year or the density we can have the next year. And we can do that through temporal series. Just to conclude, Agriculture, um, um, are, the precipitation is an indicator where the mating or oviposition is going to take place. Remote sensing and GIS are very important tools, and probabilistic tools are useful to for the forecast. And I also would like to thank all these organizations, Higsby or Ursa. Uh, the Plant Health uh, Committee where we're working. This is our group. This, there are four panelists, which is part of the locus team. We have been analyzing some situations of what is happening in the, with the Central American locus. Our sincere thanks to all these gentlemen who are in this image. Thank you very much. And that will be all for now. Thank you very much, Mario. Excellent presentation. I'm monitoring to see if there's any question. There was one, the one for John. We're gonna give it to him later on so that he can answer. I don't see any question for Mario. Before going to the next presentation, I'm gonna ask Mario regarding the link with this group, you have to have researchers and team who work in the field, like in the organization that where we work, where we have the control. Sometime it is important to strengthen this link with a final objective to prevent for early detection. And the final objective is the grower doesn't be effective for the locals or uh, grasshoppers. So how important is, Mario, this link? How can we um, involve the uh, growers so that the team is complete? I think it's a very important part, the link of all the sectors which are managing Grasshopper and locals. Yes, Hector, thank you very much. It's very important. Sometimes we believe the way we're working 
is the optimal way or the ideal way. But in fact, this is from our perspective. One thing is what happening in the field. So we can model and say that the north is where the, the pest is going to be there, but it says the north, but then it is the south. So we're not mistaken, but we're not certain that we didn't see the south. And sometimes it have to be has to do with uh, do with the behavior, which we haven't included in the model. So it's very important. So I summarize this in a paradox. We want to do a good stew, a good food. We have a good chef, but he the chef doesn't know where to find the ingredients. So we have to go to the field and talk to those people. So I didn't know those parts, the good chef, and where to find the fruits or vegetables, fresh vegetables, is going to reach more than what we have. And this is what you're mentioning. It's very important, this link, to make those bridges to have a successful management of this octopteros pest. Just continue with the event and following the uh, agenda and the time frames. We're going to move now to Dr. Dr. Nicolette from the USDA. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Use of GIS for Rachel Grasshopper and Montburn Cricket Management. Go ahead, Jordan. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Jordan Nicolette. I'm a geographer and biological scientist with the USDA APHIS, uh, Plant Protection and Quarantine. I'm currently on the Phytosanitary Analytics team with Sunil Kumar, but I'm located in Riverdale, Maryland. Today, I'll be talking about the use of GIS for rangeland grasshopper and Mormon cricket management. This project has been in collaboration with Dr. Sunil Kumar and Derek Waller, uh, who are both members of APHIS PPQ as well. So first for an overview of GIS uses in management, um, I kind of broke it down into three categories. The first being the actual spatial data collection and storage of GIS data with the PPQ's domestic data improvement initiative. And then I'll also talk about our grasshopper and Mormon cricket dashboard and web app. Sometimes I abbreviate grasshopper and Mormon cricket to GHMC. In, our, in the second section, I'll talk about analytics for predictive safeguarding with our yearly hazard map, outbreak modeling, and species models. And then lastly, I'll talk about an application for data visualization with this GIS data in a 12 grasshopper species story map. So an overview of what the domestic data improvement initiative is, is PPQ's effort to enhance and standardize data collection. Each of these goals work in conjunction in each other in a circle. So the first goal of improving domestic data quality will then go into increasing our actual electronic data collection, and then more internally, improve our accessibility to this data within our organization, and then lastly, enhance our actual reporting of the data so that we can find different holes, and then which goes back into improving quality. Now for the actual data quality, uh, we in PPQ, we have the idea of core data, which is a data standard to assure qu quality and consistency of field data for all of our domestic programs. It's important to be consistent with our data collection because it's used for emergency response, detection, elimination, eradication, and management. This data can kind of be put into four, five different categories, metadata, parcel, site data, point and sub-site data, activity data, and sample data. But for grasshopper and Mormon cricket, I'll mostly be talking about the different point and sub-site data and sample data. This will make more sense in the next slide. So increased data collection has to do with being consistent with our data collection. All PPQ employees only use Esri mobile apps for consistent data collection of species using iPads and apps such as Survey123 and Esri Collector. As you can see the screenshot in the middle of the slide, uh, this, look, this shows a PPQ employee using this iPad to pinpoint a location within one of these apps. 
this location has to be within a certain amount of GPS accuracy to add the point where they can then add notes about the survey stage of the, in this case, the grasshopper, the amount of grasshoppers in this location, the life stage that it's in, the range type and treatment. Now this is customizable, but then also will be consistent for all employees to use. This occurs at about 20,000 different PPQ grasshopper Mormon cricket survey sites. And these surveys are broken down in the spring for nymphs to then forecast to the fall for adults. And then in the fall, we're surveying adults to then forecast for the next year. Now, putting all this data into a visual, we can look at our grasshopper Mormon cricket dashboard. This dashboard is in, uh, important to show the higher level program status of our actual program. It shows the money that's contributed, but also the area of coverage that goes into each area. If we can see on the left side of the, of the figure on the screenshot, you can use a different date range for a certain year or time of year, and also select the species that you want, such as a grasshopper, Mormon cricket, or both, the population class, and even a geographic area, such as a state. Now, since we can filter and query this data, we can then see how much money goes into this area or time period, and then also the total area that's being protected or managed uh, within that uh, query. This is really important for stakeholder outreach. Uh, it's, we can also show how efficient our controls are and a cost benefit ratio as well. Uh, not to mention, we can also create graphics such as uh, the amount of surveys that are conducted and when these surveys are conducted and, when, and how long it takes for them to be completed. Now this information is only accessible for PPQ employees, but then the figures will sometimes be used in the reports. Now on the more of the geospatial side, we use uh, the Grasshopper and Mormon Cricket web app to, actual, to actually filter and query the geospatial data itself. Uh, a PPQ employee can use this application to, like before, select a date, uh, a pest, or a different state to then uh, query for spatial data and then export it to their own GIS. This allows the PPQ, PPQ person to run their own analysis, but if they would like to just make a custom map, they can write comments and clip to an area to make uh, a figure or a map for their own use. This is a very highly customizable platform and uh, it's also only available for our employees. Now, taking the data one step further, um, every year, APHIS PPQ uh, creates uh, hazard maps, which are used uh, to predict grasshopper density for the next year. Uh, it uses a spatial interpretation technique uh, called Bayesian Cregan. Uh, however, this technique only uses last year's data to predict the next year's uh, possible density, and there are no uh, considerations of biological climate or landscape factors. In order to fill in these gaps, uh, my colleague Sunil is working on the predictive outbreak model. Uh, this outbreak model will hopefully will hopefully learn more about out uh, grasshopper uh, outbreaks by using uh, historic rangeland data from the past 18 years, uh, where there have been grasshopper outbreaks of more than 15 grasshoppers. This is uh, set for the 17 Western United States and is using a predictive spatial modeling framework, as he mentioned before. He's also capturing uh, certain variables within the grasshopper's life cycle, such as the overwintering period, the hatching period, uh, and the diapause period. We'll hopefully also have outputs that will have data visualization, such as those other applications, so the users can uh, select certain areas to learn more about outbreaks in those regions. Now, up to this point, I've talked mostly about grasshoppers and Mormon crickets at, uh, pretty generally. However, there are about 400 different species of these grasshoppers in the Western United States. However, 12 of them are considered to be the most, 12 of the most economically damaging species to our area. So the goal of this project is to create potential distribution models for each of these 12 species uh, for the Western US. Now we know a good amount about their, each of these species biology, and we know that they have different distinct biological preferences and environmental preferences. However, the actual area of where these grasshoppers are found is, uh, is a little bit outdated. As we can see, the range map in the top figure here is about 30 or 40 years old. And this is the last that we have for a lot of these species. 
we're looking to update these to more um, potential distribution maps to show the habitat suitability for these species across the Western US. Hopefully this will enable some more uh, targeted management for these species or groups of species. We're also looking to, we're also creating comprehensive data sets for each one of these species from online and PBQ databases, which I'll get into in the next slide. So the actual collection of this data, as John mentioned before, is the most crucial and important part of, the, of, the, of our project. We wanted to encompass the entire species range. So we were collecting data from Canada, Mexico, and North America. In order to do this, we combined from many different data sources, such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, Symbiosha Collections of Arthropod Networks, and, and iNaturalist. These three are online databases which were then filtered for research grade only data and then cross-checked with some of our uh, biologists within PPQ. We also then combined this data with uh, our data from the DDII, as I mentioned before, and our field surveys. And then we also obtained data from state level managers and our state plant health directors. Now, a lot of challenges in this uh, process were that there were, from the online resources at least, there were some subspecies and incorrect identifications that needed to be filtered out and uh, looked over because it was really crucial to have accurate um, input data. We also obtained data with, with various projections and coordinate systems, which then had to be uh, subgrouped and reprojected before compiling into one consistent database. Also, as John mentioned before, a lot of times there's inconsistent state level data that we received. Some states like Wyoming or Montana with much larger, larger programs or programs that do a lot more uh, reporting and surveying will have a lot more data for, spe for some species than others. This doesn't mean that the other states didn't, or don't have suitable land for that species. They just don't have the actual ability to uh, monitor these, uh, these sorts of things. So in order to correct for this, we created a bias file to be used within our spatial modeling framework and also separately spatially filtered our data. This, is, this requires a lot of uh, uh, processing time and also automation to do these uh, processes with, within a GIS. So we used uh, certain spatial analysis tools within custom tools, which I'll get into. So for a custom tool that we've created, it's called CSV processing within Maxent, which allows the user to input a CSV with their latitude and longitude files for a certain species. This then create this then does the spatial filtering based on the parameters that the user sets, and it also allows them to create the bias file within this tool. This tool uh, uh, this tool includes a complicated Python script, which, which would be uh, difficult for some users unfamiliar with the program to uh, use. So we, we package this into a custom tool so that other people on our team or other people doing similar research could then utilize. For the actual raster and environmental data that must be processed, a lot of this was world data and came at a very fine resolution. But in order to use this data within our modeling framework, all the layers must match the same extent, resolution, and cell size. We used SDM Toolbox, which is an open source tool found online uh, to batch process a lot of these large raster files. This also would not have been possible without using our cloud storage and for our world data and our remote desktop. So because we have 12 different species models to show and a lot of different data and different sources, uh, we are currently developing a, a species story map to show a little bit more about the program itself so the user can scroll through that but also about the so the user can toggle to different results it's still in development but i can show the screenshot where the user is can select for a certain species in this case amphitornis coloratus and they can look at the climatic suitability for that species as well as the data associated with it when they click on the associated data they can also select certain points to see the data source and what year the data was collected in. They can do this for each one of the species as well. We also want to add a function where the user can print out a certain map for their region or state and also the data so that it can be available for them to visualize um, for a stakeholder use or outreach. 
In conclusion, uh, GIS for grasshopper and Mormon cricket management has allowed us to streamline data collection with the DDII. We're able to present stakeholders with useful data visualizations and forecast, forecast trends with analytics. And all this goes into improving our GIS workflow. And uh, thank you so much. I'll uh, take any questions. And if we're out of time, then also feel free to email me at this uh, address. Thank you very much for your presentation, Jordan. Thank you. We don't see any questions so far. We have a question from Dr. Eduardo Tronco. We would like to say hi to him in YouTube. I don't know if it's for John or for Jordan. I think it's for John. One question, Jordan. Of all, all these variables that you use or that are used to reduce the most important, one of the things that we see is in the modeling, the variables in terms of math, the ones that are less important, their contribution could be the one, two, three percent. Sometimes we have many. What is the criteria that you use or how can you determine we'll remove this when we don't take this to account. Sometimes we have to take that decision. Sometimes important variables of 40, 30%, we don't have any doubt, but sometimes we have five variables of one, 2%. How you say, how do you say yes, this one or this one not? This is a great question. Right. Thank this you very a, much. Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, this is something that we still work on to and variable selection is one of the hardest parts of modeling within our framework. Um, however, we, before we are running a big set of variables, what we do is run a Pearson's cor correlation coefficient to find similarities between variables. A lot of times they'll be spatially correlated within each other by their values. So two variables or three variables may be very similar, even though they're sort of the same thing, even though they may be representing different things. Um, a lot of times we like to consider precipitation, climate, temperature, soil, all separately uh, as sort of separate things. And then ones that have a similar um, variation between each other, uh, we'll, we'll consider the one with higher contribution. But that's a very good question. Mario, I think we're not getting you. Sorry. Sorry. I think there's time for one more question. Dr. Divina Barrientos from Tamaulipas, whom we greet very warmly. She asks, when the model does not work, what variables and factors are causing the malfunction? Could this be corrected short term or long term? Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's also a very good question. <laughs> so for variables that have very low contribution, but you would expect them to have a lot higher ones, um, I, th I believe that's kind of what you're asking for if uh, variables that, you know, I'm trying to think. I, are, are you asking more about the variables that you would expect to have higher contribution that don't, or the ones that, or, or that the model is not performing very high?
Yes, that's it. When the model is not performing very well, when it's not optimal, what are the causes? Well, it, and that, can this be corrected? Can this be rectified? Gotcha. So a lot of times that could possibly be that <clears throat> there are variables that you're not um, thinking about or not adding into your model that you would need to consider. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're just looking at average conditions, it may be a minimum or maximum condition that is a lot more fitting for the species rather than that. Um, or bringing in different types of remote sensing variables like, a, a, like um, let's think of like a canopy cover or something like a soil characteristic. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Thank you so much for taking that question. Your, your presentation was excellent. And now to get on with the program, we welcome Dr. Sandra Turricio, Manager of Institutional Relationships in CONAE from Argentina. She will present on remote sensing and its potential use to monitor the South American locust. Thank you so much. The floor is all yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you're seeing the slide. Is it running? There we are. There we are. Okay. This is the first one. Thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to join you in this prestigious webinar. And one of the advantages of presenting last is that we see that it's a complex problem and as many of you have pointed out we must coordinate academics science operational factors quality of data technology data quality coming from the field from remote sensors of information that has to be entered into a, a gis so I think that there are degrees of maduration when it comes to knowledge of orthopteran in the American. So it all boils down to this being ever more important to exchange experiences, knowledge, how to collect data from the field. And as Mario mentioned, the operational factor, how administrations and policies must be harmonized so that this is sustainable over time, both from the academic world and from those of us who work on the operational slant. So I will speak on behalf of the CONAE, Argentinian Spatial Agency, and I would like to speak about how a spatial agency has a strategic plan, a national plan, to provide satellite-based information on the environment, on production, and on social issues. Precisely, it is transversal to the problem of the past regarding agriculture, the environment, what pertains management and treatment of the past, and to consider outbreaks as emergencies. On this list, where we provide data to different public organizations, um, academics, the public sector, when it comes to locusts and grasshoppers, this is a very relevant issue. So CONAE in Argentina has a very relevant development with data specific to our own country. I will guide you through this and we'll look into how for a number of years now we are interconnected with different agencies in Argentina like SENASA with the support of the Ministry for Science and Technology, the National Agricultural Technology Institute, the National Weather Service, the CONICET and its associated agencies. We have all contributed 
to solving this problem. Particularly, we at CONAE are linked to SENASA and with the academic world in CEPAVE, which is the Center for the Study of Parasites and Vectors. We are addressing the needs both from the academic world and the operational slant. Now we'll address the variables mentioned before by my colleagues, data from the field collected by SENASA, especially when it comes to the South American locust and the INTA, the National Agricultural Technology Institute with the soil maps, the use of the land use, I girl climatic information and the National Weather Services provides information on temperature, rains, winds, and the Ministry for the Environment and Sustainable Development provides information on the importance of native forests, protected areas in our countries. So we are all part of the same problem and we are all working to assess when, where, what direction the locust swarm will grow and where we will be likely to find more individuals that may damage production, which impacts on agriculture. As Hector said, this does not only impact our country, it impacts the whole region, particularly when it comes to locust. You can see some maps related to precipitations, to temperature. As Mario said just minutes ago, this will help us determine the most relevant variables, which variables we can discard. Here's our inventory of native forests as part of our GIS network and we provide data and information connected to the vegetation index, which has been already mentioned, the greenness index, the land use, the land cover, the changes, the temperature at the surface of the soil at each moment, the soil moisture, and I won't go into detail, but I would like to say that we do collect information from satellites globally and regionally, but CONAI, we have a constellation, SAOCOM 1A and 1B, that provides detailed information on soil moisture, especially in the Pampas of Argentina, access to elevation models, and we have access to other data like Landsat, Sentinel, Spot, and the MODIS series with Aqua and Terra satellites. I'll tell you this so that you have an idea of what kind of information we're dealing with at CONAE, and of course this is available to SENASA. We would like to also include the intensity of winds, which impact that is the swarms of locusts mm -hmm. and something that was already mentioned before accessing technology is an important factor and perhaps if we use different layers for instance the layers of soil moisture that we have in SAOCOM, how we can use that and feed it into the geo portal that we're seeing right now with the participation of several of us present here. This signifies a change, otherwise we have to go out and look for that data. Of course, um, Nothing is perfect, there's a lot of work to be done, but now we have a lot of tools that allow us to access this information more easily and faster. The same happens in SENASA. Daily we have news and new data from the field and the academic world is evaluating what variables most impact the South American locust in years 
where we find more outbreaks and also when there are no outbreaks, because that is also valuable information in order to predict a future outbreak. These are just examples of previous work, for instance, in Catamarca, a province in the northwest. This is a land use map. by managing information, not just satellite based, but aerial images, past and present images are part of a GIS mapping. And we can see how the land use has changed, how the soil has changed. And here we have information about the 50s through aerial images. There were no satellites back then. This is mapping, this is topographic mapping. This is in the 70s aerial imagery and from the 80s onward, we have remote sensing. But the loss of mass, the loss of native forests and the influence of everything related to climate change and other extreme events. These are examples of image processing to streamline vegetation excesses that can affect biotopes of these species and when it comes to land use as well. Another operational example was we have to go back a couple of years and now we're with the grasshopper the grasshopper in the province of Buenos Aires, there was a, a quite major outbreak of a particular species and we worked closely with different departments in the province of Buenos Aires to assess where we had to conduct sampling, how land was distributed, where we found more propitious areas to fumigate and try to control grasshoppers that were devastating the area. We worked alongside with the Ministry of Agriculture and it is an example of coordinator coordination between the operational side and local authorities. Another example that perhaps left a stronger mark was in a district of the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, we identified and monitored the changes of land use through images. We found extensive agricultural areas, horticultural areas, rangeland areas, um, there was a change of soybean management. It became a monocrop in the Pampas, a monoculture, sorry, in the Pampas. And this impacted the dynamics of 10 to 12 species in that district. And here we see in GIS from fixed sampled points across 10 years, there were no outbreak years. These were the highest values, less than 10 to 12 individuals per square meter. A transition year, we started seeing how the hottest areas were populated with more density. And we reached a major outbreak in 2001, 2002, 2003 which means there must be continuity regardless of whether there is low or high demographic density. Basically, the message is coordination is key, interinstitutional dialogue is key because scientific problems meet ecological problems and this impacts production surveillance and control. And on the technological side, this is the launch of the SALCOM 1B satellite in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. This data 
must stand on their own if they are to contribute to the problem in our region for the better. Thank you so much, everyone. And if you have any questions, it's my pleasure to address them. Thank you, Sandra. Excellent presentation. As usual, we are checking for questions. I remember something you said towards the end of your presentation when you spoke about ongoing surveillance, which is something that we, we cannot stress enough because we know the history of locusts and grasshoppers in these areas when there's, when there's a retraction, when there's a bust cycle, um, shortly there's a boom cycle for sure, so we must respond timely. Do you think really that everything related to remote sensing and modeling can help? Not only to maintain an ongoing surveillance system, but to, to persuade decision makers to confirm that this is our reality. In Argentina, we know that locust is present. It is present today. We don't know when it will be gone, but we know for sure when it will that it will be back. The question is when. And that is hard to communicate to decision makers. Decision makers who will be um, assigning and allocating resources. I think, yes, I think in Argentina, this works in hindsight. We've seen a change where monitoring has been sustained in spite of everything, in spite of the pandemic, our political situation, our social crisis, everything counts. We have the National Agricultural Technology Institute listening in, and we, we can apply everything, remote sensing, technology, uh, Senasa Geoportal, uh, or CONAES Geoportal. This makes everything more difficult. Sometimes one offers the decision maker not only the nice slides, but the slides and the information that will um, result in better control so that we can raise awareness of the problem. And this impacts pesticides, insecticides, and how to protect growers and producers and a more streamlined management. I think there's a lot of work to do. Central America and South America has a different problematic and we have different resources. But we have a satellite that is available for use, for use by Argentina and the whole region, and we must learn how to use it. We, ca we have to learn how to model it and enter it into every model. It's a step-by-step -step road, but those of us who have been working on this for a long time, I can tell you we've seen changes and that gives us hope. Let us, let us keep walking the right road then. Thank you. And now let us move to the last presentation of today and we'll give the floor to Dr. Alex Latininski from FAO, who will speak about applications of remote sensing for locust management, particularly experiences in Africa and Asia. Alex? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Medina. Thank you very much to the uh, organizers for inviting me to such a, a great and very important workshop. Uh, before uh, work, before starting working for the FAO, I worked for more than 20 years uh, as extension entomologist in Wyoming, USA. So lots of problems, and lots of questions that were discussed by some previous authors are really very, very close to, to me because I also uh, worked in all these uh, problems and I I am really uh, very much interested in how 
the situation is developing uh, with, uh, regarding the forecast uh, there. Okay, but now I represent uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and uh, specifically a Locust and Transboundary Plant Pests and Diseases Group, EPPO, uh, uh, in Plant protection, Production and Protection Division. And I would like to talk about uh, two examples of the applications of remote sensing, uh, two locust problems. Okay. The first is the desert locust problematic. The desert locust is the Cerca gregaria, and the FAO has a mandate uh, from its inception to uh, manage desert locust worldwide. And in fact, the first uh, idea, uh, first time the idea to use uh, remote sensing for locust habitat mapping was advanced exactly in uh, conjunction with the desert locust. It was done more than 50 years ago now. Certainly, there was a long road which we already uh, accomplished since then. So the desert locust, it should be clearly pointed out that we are not using the desert, uh, the remote sensing uh, to see the locust because uh, our satellites do not have um, sufficient resolution. And in fact, if we do have sufficient resolution, we lose immediately the coverage, the area. So uh, it doesn't make sense to concentrate on the locust. However, we can uh, use the, uh, this very good tool for assessing rainfall, green vegetation, and soil moisture. These are interconnected parameters which are really crucial for the desert locust ecology. For rainfall, uh, we are using uh, products developed by Columbia University in, uh, in the United States with a 25 kilometer resolution and uh, we are we can have it uh, by days, decades, and even uh, months uh, in, in the past, which uh, gives us a very good picture where to expect rainfall in order to predict the movements of the locust swarms there. For the vegetation, because certainly you understand that rainfall triggers uh, green vegetation, and for that, we have several different options. And I, I should underline uh, that um, we are using this uh, operationally. This is not a, a kind of research project. This is an operational use of remote sensing uh, products in locust forecasting. So right now, we are using mostly Sentinel-3 satellite with one kilometer resolution. Uh, and it produces the attending uh, composite from daily observations. But there are, as you can see in this slide, several other options which are possible to use uh, in the future, although they have some uh, uh, cons, pros and cons. So this is a picture that shows this uh, vegetation derived from um, Sentinel-3 uh, dynamic greenness map, EVI, the same index that was used and mentioned by several uh, previous speakers. And you can see here that it gives us a very good idea, taking the 40 days, again, where to expect uh, most probably locust concentrations, because locusts are going to find these areas of green vegetation in the desert. Now for soil moisture, we are using uh, uh, NOAA products, and here uh, the map of Somalia, or in fact African corn, uh, to illustrate uh, this particular application. Uh, resolution is three kilometers, and uh, the, uh, we are using soil moisture at this point in time and 
prediction for the next 15 days. Uh, this is another picture of uh, soil moisture registration, different product. In this case, it is uh, Sentinel-1 and the uh, resolution one kilometer. Uh, Desert locust, as you probably know, uh, does not have an embryonic diapause. That means that once the eggs are laid in the soil, they will hatch within usually just a couple of weeks. But uh, desert locust needs at least 25 millimeters of rainfall uh, because eggs need to get water. So that is why soil moisture again is an extremely important parameter which can be assessed with remote sensing. Daily weather, uh, for that we are uh, using this very uh, affordable, accessible um, kind of uh, sources, um, windy.com, which gives us really, uh, it changes hourly and it gives wind, rain, temperature, uh, atmospheric pressure, all these parameters are very important because, for example, wind is important for dispersal of uh, locust swarms and their migrations. I am not talking much about models because we are also using several different models. And this is a kind of uh, working progress in terms of dispersal, in terms of prediction of movement of locust swarms. And this is a kind of uh, synthesis picture, which shows in the left part the sources of information. We are using the standardized type of locust information collection called eLocust3 at this point, eLocust3. It can be on tablets, smartphones, GPS, and so on. But also we are using drones and certainly maps. Uh, then there, there's this uh, satellite layers of information satellites. All that is going through data cube into GIS uh, and, as I mentioned, several different models which are also used. And the output is our monthly locus bulletins, uh, updates, which are usually one week or two week uh, kind of have a period, periodicity. And also we do have other products like uh, Locust Hub and Dashboard. And in fact, uh, Dr. Nicolet already mentioned similar uh, products for, or visual, visualization products for grasshoppers in the US. Very, very popular and very kind of, uh, uh, easy to use and very visible. You can see immediately the situation and its development. This is all what I'm talking, what I would like to talk about the desert locust, but uh, I'm also working on a different uh, area of locusts. It's called, we call it uh, Caucasus and Central Asia. And there are uh, 10 countries, which you can see in this slide. And there are three different locusts. And all these locusts are univoltine. That means that they do have only one generation per year, but they do have different uh, ecological requirements. So for uh, that type of locust and for this program, which by the way, we are uh, managing already at FAO for 10 years, uh, we also developed automated system of data collection similar to eLocust3 and data from uh, that system goes into a Caucasus and Central Asia locust management system, which is a GIS. It is an open uh, source GIS. You can uh, go through this link and look at what is going on. You can check which countries are uh, surveying or uh, treating and so on and so on. And in addition uh, to the field data, we are also using several uh, satellite products such as for soil temperature, 
This is mostly to estimate the hatching dates for locusts. Then we are using air temperature, clear for degree days and other kind of uh, ecological uh, parameters for um, locus development. We are using uh, also um, uh, rainfall uh, maps and uh, soil um, uh, temperature and soil moisture. All this is extremely important for um, locus catching. Uh, also, we are using NDVI, so very similar to what uh, was used by other colleagues and presented before. Uh, but in addition to those kind of, uh, I would say, uh, everybody is using those indices or parameters. In addition, we are using something specific for Caucasus and Central Asia, such as normalized, dif normalized difference water index. It is very important to estimate the areas where, uh, which were flooded and then water recedes and this is the area where migratory locust likes to lay eggs. Sometimes they are covered or flooded, sometimes water goes away. And this is very important to estimate in which areas we can expect catching. And another uh, kind of particular index is normalized difference, snow index, which is also similar. It's kind of estimate of snow melting where snow melts, uh, we can expect earlier um, hatching, earlier uh, soil warming and uh, hatching of locusts. So this again, the synthetic picture that shows you uh, the flow of information from collection in the field on tablets or smartphones. Uh, then uh, it goes to the GIS, and uh, you can see different uh, the visuals that are used, and then analysis and also locus bulletins and forecasts that we are publishing on a monthly basis during the locus season, which is from uh, March till uh, October. Uh, I should emphasize uh, and repeat maybe what was said by some other previous speakers, that remote sensing with these huge uh, capabilities, it is not a panacea. We cannot rely on just remote sensing to give us an automated forecast for locus development. Field observations, field data are crucial for uh, reliable forecast. And in fact, uh, I would like to kind of uh, reiterate that uh, locus forecast is probably more an art than a science. There's a lot of science there, and remote sensing is a big part of this science, but there is a lot of um, kind of uh, human perception, or especially of experienced forecasting. Uh, with that, I, I would like to stop here and uh, I would like to thank my colleagues, Keith Preston from FAO and Nadia Muratova, our uh, focuses in Central Asia GIS consultant. And I'm open for questions, if any. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Now I have a question. There is a, a different work in terms of the, uh, the systems that they're using in Africa, in Asia, but the methodology is the same information search, GIS, as well as a monthly bulletin, just to summarize the work of FAO is doing. 
what is the reason why there is no identical system implemented in both regions, in two different regions, like Africa and Asia? Maybe the countries where are there, the growers, producers, the information, the manage, what is the reason why, even if the methodology is similar or identical, they are using different system, different information systems. Uh, thank you for the for your question, uh, Dr. Medina. Uh, well, it is kind of simple, uh, sim rather simple to uh, explain. The situation is FAO for uh, for decades had a mandate just for the desert locust. It did not have. Mm, responsibilities to manage other species. But in the 21st uh, century, um, there are lots of areas where locusts became also very, very uh, important, economically important. And one of these big areas is Caucasus and Central Asia. And that is why uh, it was possible to start this particular program of uh, Caucasus and Central Asia within FAO. Uh, that's why we are, in fact, in that program, most of the um, approaches are very similar to what is done with the desert locust. We just call differently, but in fact, it is a very similar situation. However, you surely understand that biology of the locusts of the desert locust and the three locust species in Central Asia, very different. Ecological requirements are very different. That is why a lot of things had to be adapted and changed. So uh, that is why I'm sure that the, the system, just if we take it and artificially bring to Central American locust, it will not work because different parameters and here, uh, it is where entomologists should work with GIS, remote sensing people, to identify this interface between entomology, ecology, and information uh, science. And the last thing I want to say that very similar uh, situation is also developed, for example, in China. China also now is a very, very seriously working in remote sensing for oriental migratory locusts. And they have lots of models and other approaches, and DVI certainly, which we are also using. So you see kind of independently in different areas. In Australia, they have their own system, also remote sensing for Australian plague locusts. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I think Dr. Sumil Kumar has a question for you. Thank you, Dr. Lechininsky. This was really a um, uh, very informative uh, presentation. And I'm looking forward to exploring some of the data sets that you mentioned. And um, so my question for you is, um, we are trying to um, forecast grasshopper outbreaks in the Western United States, which you are pretty familiar with uh, this system here. But I'm lucky to have access to APHIS, you know, plant production and quarantine uh, long-term data. So our goal um, in the United States is to forecast outbreaks uh, for the next year, like what's going to happen in June, July, August uh, next year, for example, in, for 2022. Um, what my challenge is that, you know, I can generate data based on previous years, rainfall, temperature, and uh, EVI and uh, soil moisture. So it is possible to do that with the variables that I have been able to get from other places. But when I generate a model for future, how do I get those variables? Like uh, you mentioned soil moisture data, you know, you have a prediction for next 15 days, but I need those predictions for six months after today, you know, for, for July or August. Um, I want the same predictions for EVI, you know, uh, because that will change, you know, uh, but as I mentioned in my presentation, there are variables that won't change like static variables, but there are dynamic variables like soil moisture will change, EVI is going to change and, um, you know, 
Uh, climate data I can you know get access to you know from other places, but my challenge is to get you know this data for soil moisture and uh, EVI. Do you have any insights or any suggestions for that? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sunil. Uh, the question certainly is extremely important, but we cannot predict weather for the next year. And uh, that is what we have uh, the challenge for our univoltine species, like grasshoppers in the United States or locusts in Central Asia and Caucasus. To some extent, the situation with the desert locust is easier uh, to forecast because they have continuous uh, development and within next several months, something is going on. Uh, for our species, which have only one generation per year, unfortunately, we have big unknown what will go, uh, what will happen. However, I should say, that for the locusts, we do have certain indicators. And these indicators are what we call phase um, status of the population, because locusts can be in gregarious or solitarious uh, phases. And these phases can be assessed using just morphometrics, just morphology or color. So what I'm trying to teach people in the field, they need to uh, collect this data for many years, and then they will be uh, they will see the change of the morphometric characters. You can see that uh huh, the, they were mostly uh, solitarious three years ago, but last year there was 50-50 solitarious and gregarious, and this year 80% gregarious. That means that that gives you another um, additional factor for forecast. That is why for Central American locust or South American locust, in my opinion, this data is ve are very important. However, for grasshoppers, we can see, I don't know, behavioral maybe characteristics, but really nothing much, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. It do you suggest then, um, since we have you know 400 plus species of grasshoppers, uh, you know it's harder to um, predict uh, the outbreaks. Do you think we should go with individual species level modeling that probably can be you know um, done in a way that you are dealing with locusts in other areas? That's a good question, but I I am afraid that it won't be very very uh, easy to do. Uh, first, it's not easy to distinguish the species, especially in the field. Even now, 21st century, but when you have first, second instar of uh, hoppers, people in the field, they will mix, they will confuse them. And it, during the outbreaks, I know that uh, sometimes one species takes like 80% of the entire assemblage. Uh, so there are maybe 20 species, but one has 80%. Next year, the same species goes down, other species go up. So I would still go for the more generalized, like assemblage, uh, rather than going for, yeah. I mean, research-wise, you can try different species, but I don't think it will work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sumin. Um, there's another question in the chat in terms of the transmission. I don't know if it's uh, for Alex or for somebody else. It's a general question, which I'm going to repeat. Is there any type of bioindicators and other arthropod species that can be used as predictors for outbreaks. I don't know if, Alex, you have any comment regarding this question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Medina. Thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of bioindicators of locust outbreaks, 
really very difficult. I don't think that, at least I cannot think of any. On the contrary, sometimes there are bioindicators that the outbreak is going down because most of the natural enemies of locusts and grasshoppers, they become more active after the peak of the locust uh, outbreak, of, of the well, upsurge, as we say, or locust plague, because they are always lagging behind. They're always a little bit behind the uh, increase of the locust numbers. So in the, in the field, when we start to open, uh, for example, locust adults, we very often see they are parasitized by tachinid uh, flies. Many uh, larvae of tachinid flies in just one locust. And it can be really in almost in every locust. To me, this is immediately a sign that your outbreak is really going down because these um, natural enemies are uh, becoming more and more active. The same goes with egg pods. For example, in Caucasus in Central Asia, we require egg pod surveys. So every year people go in the field, dig up egg, uh, dig egg pods and see uh, how the eggs are doing. And very often they see a lot of uh, natural enemies, meloid beetles or some uh, bombylid flights and so on if we see that in big numbers like 20 25 percent of all egg pods to me it's a sign of the uh, outbreak going down however uh, for prediction of outbreak going up no by indicators no but i would like to repeat that these phase characters of locust if you have this information from the same place for many years, that will help you uh, to at least to some extent. Thank you. Thanks to Alex and all the experts that have enriched this webinar with your presentations. On my behalf, I want to thank Napo and Higsby for the organizing this event. Conclusions of this event are going to be given by Dr. Pot and then uh, Lourdes Fernandera, IECA specialist, will close the meet the event with some special mentions that she's going to give us. There were some questions. Please take into account that that the event is going to be available online through YouTube or in English and in Facebook, AICA Facebook, if you want to see it in Spanish. And if the speakers are in agreement, we're going to be able to share the presentations from today. Thank you, Mario, you, and then Lourdes Fonalleras. Thank you so much, Hector. Uh, but before we go to the conclusions, I would like to thank you. Thank you so much for the great coordinating job. Thank you to the presenters for their great knowledge that they have shared with us today. Thank you, Napo. Thank you, Jigsby. Thank you to everyone who's been listening, who's been joining us from anywhere in the world. It is complex to arrive at a conclusion after having listened to such knowledge, but I, I am going to take the initiative of ranking the top 10. Of course, there's more, but I will take just 10 uh, general conclusions. First, pest orthoptera, grasshoppers, locusts, they remain to be important pests in our continent. This was self-evident in every presentation too. GIS play a major role in spatial analysis, in trends and associations that we may see in the future. 
Three, remote sensing is a funda fundamental support for studying variables of vegetation, soil, etc., to help us locate possible signs of demographic increments, but it's not a magic formula, just a very key component for combining analysis of historic data and demographic data can help predict population dynamics, increments or outbreaks in locust. Five, we can forecast possible scenarios of outbreaks using carbon emission scenarios, an important input as John said, remote sensing so far has not been useful to locate locust, but related variables, but it is a major tool. Seven applications can be entered into modeling. There are many applications that can prove useful. Eight, Perhaps a challenge, the acquisition of data and data processing. A presenter commented on this, more than one. Acquisition of data and processing that data. Nine, another challenge, processing data captured from the field that are dependable, high quality. Ten, strengthening the operational and research coordination. We can build bridges and they can be essential. As I said, there may be more conclusions, but these are the ones I wanted to highlight. And last, thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you so much, Mario, for your conclusions. Great synthesis. They are very representative of everything that has been shared. And to close, I would like to say that thank to Mario, thank to Hector, thanks to their proactivity and their labor, we could hold this webinar today that is so important for every country in the region. From ICA and GIXV, we wish to thank Hector, Mario for their efforts and also we would like to acknowledge the high quality content of the event. Sandra, Mario, Alexander, Sunil, Jordan and Sean. Thank you very much to all of you. We especially thank the interpreters, Marta Singh and Edelka Marin Martinez, who have made an effort to render the best interpretation possible. And finally, we would like to thank hugely all the technical supporters that we do not see, Viviana Chacón, Adrián Arbiza, Ricardo Valla from ICA, who have shoulder the whole logistic so that we could hold the webinar. Thank you, everyone. And I hope that I will see you, that we will see you again in future events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. Thank you. Bye. Recording stopped.